everyone. A very warm welcome back uh, to our audience in the room and also those of you who are joining us online. Uh, hopefully you managed to get the kettle on. We've all had croissants. I actually had a blueberry muffin. It was a really good blueberry muffin. Um, but now it is time to turn our attention to the DAB radio experience with the in-car infotainment system. Now, as we heard from Martin earlier, um, he was basically saying that, of course, more cars have screens, have bigger screens um, that are powered with metadata um, or that metadata is powering that visual radio experience. Therefore, the driver distraction and the US UX design of the connected platforms has become a real priority when it comes to the design. So to kick off this session, we are now going to hear from Mike Horse. He is, of course, the CEO of the UK Trade Association for the UK motor industry, uh, the SMMT, the Society of motor manufacturers and traders. Now, Mike's going to give us a bit of an insight of where the UK car market is right now and, of course, where it's going. So over to you, Mike. Well, thank you, Nikki, and hello, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here, albeit virtually. Um, the challenges of logistics, which we'll all be very familiar with today in particular, um, means I'm unable to attend, but uh, tremendous opportunity. Just to give you an update of where we are in terms of uh, the automotive industry and some of the challenges we're facing around uh, both in terms of production supply, but also in terms of where the industry is in the move to technology. So I'm gonna run through a presentation, um, which will give you an update on some of the key statistics and uh, will hopefully give you a flavor of just where the industry is at the moment. And I must probably first begin to say just how difficult the industry is and how challenged it is at the moment. We start by production. Remember, I'm looking at UK automotive. What I'm describing here is a situation that's seen pretty much globally because the issues we face are very much global. What you see there is UK car manufacturing and you see you know, what looks to be there down 6.7%. You say, well, you know, that's not too bad, I guess. And CVs are actually up slightly. But this is compared, this was 2021 compared to 2020. Um, really difficult year last year, pandemic affected 20 or 21, pandemic affected 2020 uh, as well. Um, so we have to go back, always remember the reference to 2019 is when we had the last proper year. So last year, really difficult, you know, below 1 million units. Then look at where we are this year, and it is still down. Looking at April 20 uh, production, um, we are very much um, in a situation which, and this graph I think illustrates that, rolling year, the effect of the pandemic on supply chain shortages in particular has challenged the industry. It's a supply constraint market, which I'll talk about, but above all, it is the inability to source key components means manufacturers, global manufacturers, are unable to make the number of vehicles that they would normally do so. That, figure, that diagram that you see there in terms of a rolling year output, um, you know, it, it tells its own story. Man manufacturers are working desperately hard to source those, many, most cases, semiconductors. Um, but the, the challenges in terms of logistics, in terms of availability, if you can't get 100% of your components, you can't make 100% of your vehicles. So what are those supply chain challenges that are affecting production? Um, you know, it is raw material shortages. Um, it is global logistics uh, issues, you know, not helped most recently by the lockdown uh, in Shanghai, which has caused a bottleneck around China. Um, but the cost of logistics, as anyone who's involved in manufacturing, any moving any sort of goods and components around the country, is serious at the moment. Um, it's very expensive. Manufacturers often having to turn to air freight, which, as we know, is hideously expensive. Last year, we obviously had issues about ships getting stuck in the Suez Canal, which didn't help. Um, and then, but the biggest issue affecting our industry is the shortage of global of supply of semiconductors. This arose from COVID, whereby uh, the automotive industry withdrew some of its orders because you were going into lockdown, people weren't going to be buying cars. Semiconductor manufacturers switched production to those tech, to those industries, and some there'll be some of these listening into this, uh, this presentation, I'm sure, who are involved in that television, gaming, home entertainment, those sort of industries really grew throughout the uh, pandemic and took the lion's share of those semiconductors. As we come out of those lockdowns, we're trying to grow volumes back into manufacturing, 
but you can't get the chips because chip manufacturers, their fabs, they generally run 24 seven, so they can't just put on an additional shift to catch back on production. So really constrained, everyone in the global automotive industry is affected. Over there, that overlay that now is what we currently face, um, you know, the tragedy that is um, going on in Ukraine as a result of the Russian invasion, which is exacerbating some of those shortages and indeed shortages of other components, some of which will be made in Ukraine, um, and short to medium term, shortage of raw materials, some of which go into semiconductors, ironically, but also into um, the automotive industry. So as you can see, a really tough environment uh, at the moment. Look at the positive, what you'd hope was a, you know, is uh, the corollary of this is what's happening in terms of registering. If you, but if you can't make the vehicles, you can't sell them. Last year was 2021 was better than 2020, but only to the tune of 1%. Um, not quite the uh, recovery that we hoped last year would be. And if you look at this year, year to date, you see the effect of that shortage in supply. We're down about 20% um, in, in May. You know, again, we know the demand is there. Uh, the demand is there you know, across all different models and all different segments of the market, both business consumers and private consumers. And that's why some of the wait lists that you're hearing about six to 12 months, whether it's an electric vehicle, petrol, diesel, whatever. Um, that's why you'll see if those of you are thinking about going on holiday at the moment and renting a car, one of the reasons why that rental price will be so expensive is because they can't source the vehicles either. And they're having to pay more for those vehicles because they're in such short supply. So it's a difficult, difficult situation for the industry and for the consumer who wants to, you know, wants to renew their vehicle. Um, the one bright spot um, is, isn't so much about uh, what is happening in the overall market, because you can see there our forecast for this year is gonna be down and it's gonna take a while before we come to recovery. The bright spot is that shift away from internal combustion engines towards electric vehicles. That chart on the left there shows you the acceleration that's taking place um, in, the, in the take up both of vehicles and to a certain extent, chargers. Um, it's almost exponential growth in terms of vehicles. In actual fact, the charging industry that's going with it isn't quite keeping pace. If you look at the new car market, this year in the UK, about one in eight new car vehicles sold will be pure electric. It's, as I said, it's ex escalating rapidly. We need to make sure that we can sustain that, and it's really difficult when you have, a, when you have constraints of supply. But also, in terms of the market take-up, the industry is about to face uh, a really tough piece of regulation in the UK, which is going to mandate the proportion of sales that need to be pure electric vehicles. And that figure starts in 2024, and it's going to start at 22%. In other words, every brand, 22% of their sales are going to have to be pure EVs. Whether you've got any EVs at the moment or not, you're going to have to bring them to market. And that's going to drive the market such that by 2030, 80% of all new cars sold in the UK will be pure electric. So you can see this massive acceleration is gonna take place. The biggest obstacle isn't so much about, isn't so much despite what I've just said about the availability of vehicles, because that will ease uh, over the, as a few years goes on, but it's gonna be about charging infrastructure, which has to keep pace. If you've got a driveway, that's fine. You can charge at home. If you don't, you're dependent on on-street destination charging, then, it's much more of a problem. What I'll focus on now is, is digital radio and some of the issues around uh, the shift towards um, you know, greater connectivity of vehicles. This is, is very much germane to a lot of what you'll be discussing today. You see here the, the availability of digital radio in the vehicle park. Um, we actually stopped recording this, these, this data from about uh, two years ago, about June 2022. It wasn't actually pandemic related. But as you can see there, in terms of passenger cars, it was at 90, 92, 93, picked about 94%. Virtually every new car had digital radio um, you know, as available and, and indeed as standard. Um, looking at LCVs, again, look at the blue line at the top and you see it very much um, accelerating uh, the, the take up of that. So that is good news and it's almost become ubiquitous in vehicles. But what we are seeing is increasing other technologies in there. Connectivity is growing both in new cars and in the vehicle park, and the choice is enriched as a result of that. Um, you know, how can radio therefore be delivered and indeed other services with this changing nature of in-car uh, provision? One of the things that we do see, of course, in all of this is in the, um, 
the increasing likelihood of driver distraction. What we do see is that you know, with all new vehicles um, having digital radio, but increasing proportions and the majority now being connected such that all new vehicles will be have connectivity by 2026, that choice for the consumer is ever greater. With that choice comes more complexity and come, come some uh, possibilities of driver distraction. Now, this is always you know, related to safety. It is the biggest single concern of all vehicle mobility making sure you can address safety. And so the, you know, we welcome the work that the user experience group at World Dab is doing on this. Um, you know, we're not hearing of any particular members, but it's important to maintain that dialogue because we wanna make sure that we have the necessary um, support for the driver, for other people in the car, such that drive, distraction and hence safety isn't at risk. And this is where technology can help. Advanced distraction systems, including those with um, you know, cameras for drivers, voice control, steering wheel to mount it, trying to ensure the driver keeps their head focused very much firmly on the task at hand, which is driving. Um, heads up display is, you know, is one of their, their really there in a lot of premium vehicles. All of these types of technology, trying to make sure that we can also, that we can ensure that the driver remains focused and isn't distracted by the increasing multiplicity of entertainment and information that comes to them in the cabin. You're seeing this in regulation, are about to see the implementation of the general safety regulation. This is coming into, these dates are coming into European, what they call type approval, the regulation. That will then need to be incorporated into the UK type approval system. Since uh, Brexit, we have our own type approval system about to be introduced. But again, this is the transition of regulation to support the ongoing improvements in safety, and it will address this. And in terms of the user experience, the last thing there is, what you'll see in terms of automated vehicles. And from this year, later this year, you're likely to see one of the first vehicles that has an automated system that will allow you to take your hands, feet, brain off for a period of time in specific circumstances on a motorway in short screen, in, in short and slow speeds and lose that task. A highway code has had to be changed to enable that and we're waiting for full government uh, legalities. So what you see there is this continuing evolution of technology increasing consumer choice and availability in the car. The cars are getting cleaner as well. They're getting more carbon, carbon centric, uh, carbon emission free. Massive changes taking place in the industry and the industry is trying desperately to meet with ongoing challenges and these new advanced technology introductions. So I hope that's given you a flavor. Um, any uh, follow-up questions? Sorry, I can't be with you again said, but please do contact me in person. Thank you very much. Nice one. Thank you very much, Mike. I think we should give him a round of applause, even if he is virtually with us. <laughs> really, really interesting there to get that update on the UK car market. I mean, it really has been a, a tough couple of years, hasn't it? But uh, it looks like uh, things are hopefully changing, although we're not quite out of the storm yet. So what does the future look like for DAB in the car? Well, to join us now um, is a group of people who've been working some time on optimising DAB in the car and um, we have a bit of a mix here we've got Gregor who's going to be here with us on stage but we've also got some people joining on zoom so Gregor Perch from Cariad um, who is also the chairman of World DAB UX group also joining us on zoom we have Jason Malur from um, All In Media and then of course our moderator Lindsay Mack from the BBC so uh, Lindsay over to you Hey, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. And again, sorry we can't be there with you. And I hope Gregor will be looked after and has to do it on his own. So obviously, as everyone knows, DAB has been really successful at keeping live radio at the forefront of the car dash. But we all know there are other players going to that space. Manufacturers are providing their own operating systems, and also more of these are not to use Google. So the questions we're really looking at in this panel are, how confident are we as an industry that radio will be prominent and findable in those operating systems? And how good the experience will it be? And how do we ensure that we will be able to provide robust and engaging metadata in every form? So we're now gonna hear from Gregor from Cariad and Jason from Xperi on the work they're doing with Google and all the other operating systems as well. And also why collaboration is so key to ensure radio's presence in the dash is safe. So over to you first, Gregor. Thank you, Lindsay, for, for the very nice introduction. Uh, and hello to the, to the audience. I'm happy to actually be here in, 
in the audience and see you and maybe talk to you. So I like to talk about the future of radio today. And could you go forward to the next slide? Um, this is a little about uh, me, what I'm doing. I'm a product owner for, for radio and I'm striving for an exciting user experience and I'm doing this as Carriot, uh, which is supporting a lot of different brands from the Volkswagen um, companies. So just to name a few, VW, Audi, Seat, Skoda, Lamborghini and so on. So you can see them all. So here a quick glimpse what the radio looks like like today in, in most of the Volkswagen brand cars. And you can skip for forward one, one more. Um, essentially, um, it's, a, it's a strive for working and improving metadata that it's not like this plain and empty dashboard we, we are accustomed with in the last 20 or, or 50 years, just the station list or just even a tunable frequency. It's more about finding your favorite station. You can recognize it by a nice station logo and you will also be accompanied with, with some station or cover art, which is also coming through broadcast or, or online. And as I said, especially accompanied cover art is, is more important than ever because radio um, has some, some media opponents uh, which actually giving this uh, kind of metadata since, since years. And we are striving to go forward to deliver a, a similar or even better experience to make that happen for, for the future. So radio is giving out um, a very good audio experience, um, both from broadcasting side, but also in the experience in the car and metadata is a key thing for that. Um, next step for me today is giving you a quick glimpse for the future as radio would, would change and emerge in a world of apps. And this is what we can see in the future. So we have the, um, the mobile and the car world joining on the basis of Android Automotive or Android Car AOSP. And what we can see here, um, media is looking quite well already in the Android world of things, but radio is again quite sad and overlooked by the, by the Google and IT uh, stuff in the world. So this is where we need to do something again to have a similar good experience with additional metadata also in Android optimized systems. So what we can do to, to go there, we, we launched a big initiative together with WorldUp, NAB, and a big round of broadcasters like Commercial Radio Australia, NPR, BBC, SWR, but also car manufacturers and network providers to work together that we need to improve not only uh, the look and feel, but also the interfaces which are provided by Google as part of the AOSP to deliver a similar e nice experience and uh, nice to look and nice to use experience in the dashboard. So this is what we are striving forward that also on the Android side of things, we will see similar functionality I already shown with current system, but also for the, for the future, because it's important to not only match what's possible with the media, but also use the versatility we have in broadcast and, and audio production also to show off in the metadata, be it textual or with, with additional cover art. So next thing 
we want to um, see, talk, and think about is how will radio compete in the future with those unlimited amount of, of media apps? So what can we do to actually even improve beyond just the streamlined radio broadcast or online broadcast? So this is what, what we need um, from the broadcasting side of things. It's a lot of important information we need to import into our dashboard to give the user all the information, station logos, radio text, dynamic labels, slideshow, and a lot of those small things. But if they are not there, um, you already saw how, how bad it, it, it's looking. If you don't have it, it's really dull and you only have the audio and yeah, it's even hard to find the station. And for, for the broadcasters who are not providing metadata, they are um, looking bad um, compared to those who do. And um, what I like to present again, I, I presented this kind of slide already like um, two or three years before. So I like to revisit how is the metadata coverage compared to the different country, countries. So what we saw compared to 200, 2017 to 18, um, uh, DAB SPI station logo coverage on broadcast, yeah, uh, didn't see any big gain, but we saw a lot of gain in DAB slideshow. Um, this was really interesting and not expected, but um, I, I looked through our data and I saw a significant um, increase between 20 and 30 percent of stations adding slideshow to the um, to their stations. So, um, but sadly, although they are delivering the slideshow, it's it's usually just a station logo. So uh, they are not going the next step to give the right metadata, matching song art or matching weather data or news pictures or something like, like that. And yeah, as the online um, station logo were already quite high, we also saw no additional gain there. And I'm coming to the last final and not least interesting bit. Uh, what we think uh, we can improve the radio experience in the car dashboard for, for the future. We think about having recommendations um, for the actual listening. So if, if the customer is going for his lovely BBC4 or kind of jazz service, we also try to say to him, yeah, um, if you drive out in the countryside, we know you like jazz and, and some talk or special sports station. Let's try this one. Maybe you don't discover it yet. Um, please, please try that. And we also see an upcoming need that there is an easy possibility to um, get a hold of the current podcast of a playing show because yeah, it's, it's always coming back to me. I'm hopping in a car, go on my commute, and I'm right in the middle of a very interesting talk with a politician or with a famous actor, and I'm missing the half of it because I'm only driving like uh, 10 to 20 minutes, and I'm losing that. And I think it would be really appreciated by the car owners that there is a one button solution to say, yeah, I would really like to um, add this programming to, um, to my favorites to say, yeah, this, is, this, this would be my, my funny thing for, for the future. So um, what we really like to improve on is um, we, we, we know what the customer is doing in the car. We already have something like a, um, 10 last most plus most played stations 
and I think we can improve or improve on it to give the customer some, some better recommendations to have an easier and nicer feel and even, even kind of smart feeling. Oh, the, the system is really knowing what I'm doing and um, it's giving me new chi choices I wouldn't come, come up because yeah, I like to drive. I don't have to time to scroll through 100 stations while I'm driving because I need to drive its traffic and, and so on. And that would be all for, for today. I'm really happy seeing you guys and um, a lot of familiar faces. So thank you for the possibility for me. Thank you. Uh, Gregor, thank you. Can I actually pass over to Jason because we're actually running out of time now. Jason, why, why aren't you going to talk about um, some of the other work you're doing with the other operating systems as well? Could you also touch a little bit on, um, you know, obviously you're calling broadcasters to, to provide stronger metadata. Many already do, but one of the things we get here a lot from broadcasters is how can they be confident the metadata they're going to give is going to be used properly, not with sort of, especially if it's a public broadcast, not with pre-ad roles around it and everything else. So if you could touch on that as well, that'd be great. Of course, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. Sorry I couldn't make it in, uh, in person today. There are various factors that conspired against us. Um, I, I think that's a really good question on, on the metadata control. And I, th I think it's been something that's becoming much more important in recent times. I think broadcasters are very concerned that if they make their metadata available, where does it end up? And I think uh, a number of broadcasters have seen situations where particularly audio streams have ended up in, in apps or environments where they didn't expect. And, uh, and obviously in some ways, there may be some positive aspects of that in terms of reach, but actually if the audio streams are costing you money, um, you might not be happy about it. So I think from our perspective, what we see is broadcasters, or the best way for broadcasters to do that is to have some kind of contractual relationship with whoever's distributing their content um, and that gives them control. So we have the, the constraints around the content in terms of where it can be used are very clear, what platforms it can be used on are very clear, and, and also basic things like how do you update it? Actually, if you're providing logos and audio streams and one of your station logos changes or one of your audio streams changes or you need to pull a podcast, does the platform respect that and, and update as it should? Okay. Thanks, Jason. Also, are you going to show just a few of your slides, if you can, as well? Just see yes, some that, would, that would be great if we, could, uh, if we could start those. Um, so, so just before we start, I just wanted to give a, a two-second overview of, of Experian all in media. Um, I, I'm, I know some of us already, uh, some of you already know us, and we're lucky enough to work with some of you as well. But Xperia has been in the radio business and particularly the uh, automotive radio business for many years, um, integrating the HD radio standard into uh, all of the car makers operating out of the US um, and working with the tier one suppliers to achieve that as well. And then more recently, um, integrating our connected radio solution into cars and, and all in media has been developing studio solutions and mobile apps since, uh, since 2007. Uh, which uh, does seem like a long time uh, these days, but uh, and and we joined uh, Experian in 2016, and and as part and parcel of our business, we've become I wouldn't necessarily say experts because that perhaps oversells us a little bit, but we spend a lot of time getting metadata out of radio stations into our apps um, and into uh, onto DAB, onto HD radio, onto RDS, and all of the other digital platforms. That the radio stations want to get onto. So we've been um, very busy helping stations on board to our connected radio product, but also our own apps and helping stations get onto other platforms as well. So we're familiar with, with both the value of the metadata and the real world problems of, of getting it out of um, stations and, and doing it reliably. Because obviously if you've got uh, now playing data coming out or show data, that needs to be correct and it needs to be delivered in a timely way. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so the um, Xperia's hybrid radio product is called DTS Auto Stage, um, and this was launched back in 2020. Um, we've got coverage in 68 countries, which means in 68 countries, we've got rich metadata for the radio stations in those countries. 
And, and the product is an API. So what it provides to the car maker is all of the information that they need to, to build a rich radio experience of, of the like that Gregor's talking about. And, and I think we all want, we want to protect radio. And I think there's two salient points here for, for broadcasters. One is um, there's no cost to integrate with the platform. Um, and the quid quo pro, if you like, of, of putting the metadata into the platform is that you get metrics and analytics back. So you can see what's happening um, with your, your data in real time or, or consumption in real time. And it's, uh, and it's a platform that's going to continue to innovate. So at the moment, um, it's live uh, in Mercedes. And if uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so here's a, a photo of the system live in a Mercedes. Um, and I think regardless of how we do it, I think our concern across the board is how do we make sure that DAB and, and broadcast more generally can be prominent in the dash? And, and as per Gregor's comments, we can't do that without the radio experience being a rich experience. And I think everyone's talking about a similar theme um, when it comes to automotive, but, but we also need to understand that it, it's a relatively complex issue and requires a lot of collaboration. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So uh, talking about metadata and how we do it and, and, and how we get it uh, into, into our platform, um, it, it, it's a complicated slide and, it, and it's a complicated issue in some ways because obviously um, across the world, there's a lot of different radio stations and radio stations are, you know, some are extremely proficient technically and can do all of this on their own and, and some of the stations are not. So we collect data where we can. So uh, our preference is for direct ingest from a broadcaster. Um, and uh, we've integrated with a lot of uh, larger broadcasters, but we also integrate with uh, aggregation platforms such as Radio App, which is uh, an aggregation platform operated by Commercial Radio Australia, which gives us all of the commercial radio stations in Australia um, in a consistent, uh, consistent way. So it makes life much easier for us. And could I have the next slide, please? And, and this is a thank you slide, really. We, we work with a lot of European broadcasters um, and, and we just we don't take the support for granted. We need to work together to make this platform work. And we're also uh, completely aware that there are other platforms that broadcasters want to support. So, so we appreciate broadcasters getting involved and, and working with us. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to, to share this slide as well, which is a, this is a snapshot of activity on the platform. Um, so every little green dot, I know they're quite small, um, is, is an is, is a engagement from a car through the API to our platform. So as you can see, it's concentrated in um, particular areas, but actually the usage is pretty broad around the world. And, and if we could have the next slide, please. Um, this zooms in on Europe, and again, we've got a concentration of activity in Western Europe, but we've also got a lot of activity um, elsewhere as well. And, and the platforms, as I said, we, we launched it in 2020, um, and uh, we're likely to see significant increases in usage over the next, um, the next little while. But the exciting thing about this is to broadcasters is we can actually share with them this information as it pertains to their station. So we're actually getting... Um, some real measurement of broadcast activity in a car, which I don't think has been widely available before. Um, and could I have the next slide, please? And, and this is what I wanted to, to end on, really, which is, which is, again, a snapshot. And it's a snapshot of radio stations around the world um, with content from our system. And, and you know, we, we obviously need metadata to be accurate and consistent and complete. But also it should be from the broadcaster. The, the broadcaster should be the person or the organization supplying this metadata. Um, and I think and I think that's very important. And it's it's a in some ways it's a bit of a painful task because we need to, there's a lot of integration work that needs to be done to make that happen. But the result is a much, much richer experience for the listener. And I think it gives the broadcaster much greater control um, as these platforms evolve and become richer over time. And, uh, and that's the last slide from me. Great, thank you very much, Jason. It's really interesting. And I think it's interesting for all of us actually on this conference today to see there is such a common theme 
across so many of these presentations today as well and how key metadata is. And without good metadata, you will not get an engaging experience for radio. And we've got to compete against these streaming companies and really provide that. I've got one final question, if we have time, which is we've um, touched on collaboration. And we talk always about collaboration, how key it is, it's really important. But what do we really mean by collaboration? You know, is it we all get into a room together and we sit and talk about how we can get better metadata, metadata from broadcasters, but how do we do that? So what, what is collaboration? So I'll go about one minute only from each of you. So Gregor, one minute from you. On where, what, do you what do you think we should do around collaboration and what, is it, what does it mean to you? Yeah, um, I can do it really quick. I, I think what, what I presented together with you is the NAB pilot together with WorldDub and a lot of the broadcasters, car manufacturers and network providers. This is the kind of effort we need to take together because we can't move giants like Google and anybody else to, to do what we want. Uh, but if it's more than one saying, yeah, we need these tweaks and um, then it's better for all of us. I think it was a very moving possibility to, to do it in that way and we achieved a lot here. Thank you, Gregor. And Jason, quickly from you. Uh, I think I completely would agree with Gregor. And, and I think generally it's reaching out to, um, for broadcasters, reaching out to service providers, car makers, uh, organizations like WorldBAB, and making sure uh, there's likely to be multiple places you're going to need to or going to want to send your metadata. So making sure your metadata is in a form that you can get it onto those platforms easier. And whether the stations do that themselves or get people to help them to do it, as long as it's there and available, getting it onto a new platform is generally a relatively small task. Great. Thank you very much. So I think really the call out here is get that metadata, provide the best met metadata you can to really enrich your user experience in the car. Actually, thank you very much. Thank you, Gregor, and thank you very much, Jason. Bye-bye. Lovely. Thank you again for that really interesting session there. Um, and just a quick reminder to submit those questions because we will be doing that uh, a little bit later in the session. Now it is time to hear from the World DAB team who have created a new set of guidelines on something which, of course, is a top priority for all automatic automotive manufacturers and for all of us. And that is keeping drivers safe safe. So let's hear from Rudiger Hentz, who is the project manager of Tuna Development at Harman, and Nick Piggott from Radio DNS. Hello, my name is Nick Piggott. I'm the project director at Radio DNS. And along with Rudiger Hentz from Harman, we're here to talk to you about the new driver distraction guidelines that are being published by World DAB. In a minute, I'll give you some specifics of what the guidelines cover. But first of all, I'd like Rudiger to present to you the background for this initiative. Rudiger. Hello, good morning. My name is Rudiger Enzo from Harman, and I want to present uh, a short uh, introduction into the um, slide, uh, into the, our uh, session today. So, today we want to talk about driver restrictions related to DAB. We want to talk a little bit about the background, the world DAB activities in past, and we want to present a new guideline for broadcasters and car manufacturers related to this topic. In this session, we want to show you some facts for driver distractions related to visual services of digital radio. In focus are slideshow service and text information. Part one of this presentation is related to background information to understand why we should have driver distractions in mind and is related to activities in past. The background. We have many different distractions in the car and on the street if we are driving. The children or the grandma on the back seats, the commercial informations, the looking the good looking person in the car behind or the Harley biker with a big tattoo, whatever. One of the distractions in the car is the radio. Function and visibility of radio changed in the last years from a simple audio device 
to an entertainment system with colored display that can present many additional information about status of the car, additional information for the radio program, the status of account for phone, phone connection, and much more. Why it is important to have slideshow and text information in mind if we are talking about driver destructions? Traffic on the street is increased more and more. For example, freight traffic in Germany was increased by 10% in the last 10 years. Today, it's more risky to drive also with help of assistance systems. And the ranking of traffic accidents is driver distraction in the top 10 in Germany, depending on the statistic between number five and eight. In statistics for driver distractions, mobile phones, radio systems, and navigation are listed as main reason for distractions. For using of mobile phones and TV, many countries have already regulations, but not for radio. Radio was not in focus until now. To avoid that radio will go into focus and that we will get hard regulations from administration side, our recommendation is to limit the distractions based on visual, visual services and advanced by ourselves. Let's have a look at the street. Typical statement after a crash, I looked only for one second on the radio. But what means looking one second on the radio instead on the street? An example and a short looking back to your driving lessons should help. In one second, in a city with speed of 50 kilometers per hour or 30 miles per hour, you are driving around about 14 meters. If you are looking at the radio display for two or three seconds to get the content of a slideshow or a text information, then you are driving between 30 and 40 meters blind. Conclusion, many contents means a lot of distraction. On other point of view is the brightness of pictures and the position of the display. In case that the display is close to the windscreen or on top of the dashboard and you have it all the time in your view, then it's possible that at night a slideshow with a white or a very bright picture will blending. In worst case, you will not see the person or any other barrier on the street. Therefore, we have to have the design of visual information in mind. Brightness is mandatory for slideshow design. Previous World DAB activities, some of you would say this topic is not new. We already discussed it in the past. And you are right. We already discussed this topic and in 2012, the Receiver Workgroup Germany published a paper related to design and usage of slideshow and text information. Proposed usage of visual services on digital radio supporting DAB, DAB plus, DMB radio for the digital radio launch in Germany. What a long title and the paper is very old. It includes DMB radio. What was the intention? Same as today. To propose guideline for implementation of visual, visual information also in 2012, we decided that driver distraction is a very important aspect. The content of the paper is still valid. Conditions for presentation of visual content, transmission duration versus update of content, compression algorithm, algorithms, limitation of update rates, field problems, guideline for design, usage of categorized slideshows, and examples for slideshow design. To understand why content of this paper was not used and not known, we have to look back to the beginning of the 2010s. What was the status of DAB? In some countries, DAB was running in pilot projects only. 
low number of DAB examples and the bad coverage we found in the field. Less numbers of receivers were in the market and mostly without colored displays. Stations not provided slideshows, many cars not equipped with DAB. Colored displays mostly offered in high class cars and DAB option was very expensive, mostly together with navigation system as an offer. Take rate of DAB radios was low. The status today, 10 years later, is completely different. More and more cars worldwide are equipped with DAB. DAB is mandatory in all new cars in Europe since 2020. Color display in this is a standard today, also in low and mid-class cars. Coverage of DAB is clearly increased. Many new services and ensembles on air worldwide. FM stations switch to DAB or transmitted in parallel. DAB is accepted as a digital standard. Radio makers using metadata and visual services to increase the visibility on the radio market. All these improvements in DAB were the starting point to talk again about driver distractions and to create a new version of guideline for radio visuals. To present the results, I want to hand over to Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Rüdiger. So Rüdiger's really clearly explained the background to this issue and why driver distraction is becoming more important that we look at the issues and find solutions to them. So the second half of this presentation is explained to you what we lay out in the new driver distraction guidelines and why it's really important for your teams to engage in them. Because we've identified three contributing factors to driver distraction. They're legibility, relevance and frequency of update. And when designing for digital radio, we need to consider all three of those. Legibility is really important because, as Rüdiger says, every second you have your eyes on a screen, there is a second that you're not looking at the road. And that could be 30 to 40 metres of travel and far further if you're on a high speed road. So it's really important for broadcasters to understand what legible design looks like but also to explain to manufacturers how to present that design in a way that's legible to drivers. We need to understand mutual understanding of what display looks like. Relevance is probably more important for the broadcasters. Every time you update content on the screen, it will cause a driver distraction. So only put content on the screen that's really helpful to the driver. And we've made some suggestions of things that are helpful and also pointed out some things that we know happen now that are not that helpful to drivers and may just be there by default. But we've also pointed out that it's important for manufacturers to update content without driver intervention. We know that there are some digital radios, for instance, that require the driver to interact with the radio to do things like see slideshow or read text. And that's making that distraction issue more of a problem. And the third one on frequency of update, it's pretty obvious. Uh, broadcasters shouldn't be trying to create too many distractions to the driver and we've posited a 20 second refresh interval that means that a broadcaster knows how often they can send content it also means that a manufacturer knows that they can implement blocking on bad actors on bad broadcasters at 20 seconds to protect from unnecessary driver distraction in amongst all this, we've taken into account the fact that local legislation also applies and may override some of our guidelines. We talked a bit about understanding a mutual design environment, and we know that some designers at radio stations really don't understand how their content is going to be displayed, which is in stark contrast to the very clear understanding they have of how things look on mobile and how things look on desktop. So we have far more detail in these driver distraction guidelines about how to design for screens in vehicles and how to check that your designs are legible. And that is followed up with a similar piece of information from manufacturers on how to present that design legibly. We also talk about the way that the system should be operated to minimise driver distraction and that's more of information on things like the update frequency and what activity a driver should have to do in order to see updated content. 
Finally, we've gone into more detail uh, to help designers on specifics of design patterns, what elements should look like to be rendered properly in the vehicle. That's really important about understanding that a designer at a radio station can create something and they know how it's going to appear in a car and a manufacturer understands what the design process behind something has been so they can display it properly. The audience for this document is important. It needs to go in radio stations to your brand and content designers, the people who are creating visual assets and text information for your radio station. At the manufacturers, it needs to go to user interface designers so they understand what kind of content is going to be provided and how it needs to be showed to drivers. And it needs to go to the technical and the development teams to make sure that all the technology that underlies both the design, the transmission, the reception and rendering of this content is implemented correctly as possible. So those are our new World DAB driver distraction guidelines. You've understood the background to them and why it's important. And we've given you a brief overview of the contents. But what's important now is that you pick them up and you distribute them within your teams so that as quickly as possible, we get to a shared understanding of minimized driver distraction so that, as Rudiger has pointed out, we don't find ourselves being legislated for when we could have regulated this ourselves much more easily. Thanks to Rudiger for his contribution to the presentation. And if you have any questions, please get in contact with us at World DAB. Thank you very much, Nick and Rudiger there. Really, really interesting and a very important piece of work, of course, from World DAB for both broadcasters and the automotive industry. Always crucial to keep drivers and listeners safe. Now, moving on, when we last met in November, way back then, uh, we learned from the Car Buyer Survey that one of Car Buyer's most desired features is voice control. We can probably blame Alexa for that one. Um, but now it's time to hear from Lawrence Harrison from Radio Player, who's joined by Johan Wouters, the Director of Product Management at Serence, who are the market leader for voice in the car. So for a look at current and future developments on voice assistance in the car and what that means for radio, over to you guys. Hello everybody, my name is Lawrence Harrison. I am Director of Automotive Partnerships at Radio Player and we're very proud to be sponsors of the World DB Automotive event today. Uh, I'm, I'm also delighted to be uh, hosting this session, but before we start, I just wanted to introduce Radio Player for those of you that may not know who we are. We're quite unique in this space because we are non-profit and supported only by radio broadcasters. And we work on their behalf to keep radio strong in the car by providing official quality metadata, hybrid radio technology, and long-term partnerships and collaborations to the automotive sector. We have two current car manufacturer partners with the brilliant Cariad VW Group and BMW Group with more to follow soon. And our real focus is on creating the best possible user experience for radio in the car, which is why I'm so pleased to be hosting this session on voice because voice is critical to radio's success and prominence in the car in the future. And on that note, I'm delighted to introduce Johan Valters, Director of Product Management at Serence. Hi, Johan. Hi, Lawrence. Very nice to meet you. It's great to see you. And where, just, where are you speaking from? Where are you located? Talking to you from Switzerland. Unfortunately, not in London as we had all planned to be. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's absolutely great to have you. And I'm conscious that some of the audience may not know much about Serence, uh, the, the organization. I wonder if you could just say a bit more about who Serence is and what you do and how you work with the automotive sector. Sure, um, very happy to talk to you about that. So we at Serence are the market leader in voice in the car. Um, there is over 450 million cars on the road today with our technology on board, be that um, for voice recognition, for text to speech, uh, or for wake word recognition and uh, many other um, speech enhancement technologies and so on that we provide. Um, that's one in two cars, new cars shipping today with our technology on board. Um, on my, um, I also can talk a little bit about all the people we work with. Uh, so we work with um, really all the major car brands in the world, the different tier ones, uh, and we have extensive um, uh, partners also for content and we work, of course, with the big tech players. So, I mean, you've got a huge amount of experience uh, in the voice space. How long has Sarah's been working in the voice area in automotive now? 
Um, so we've been um, working for several decades. We spun out about two years ago uh, out of Nuance Communications. Uh, that's a, a company that some of the, the um, audience may know. Um, and that's about two years ago. And since then, we've been focusing exclusively on automotive. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we're delighted to have you. Um, let, let's dive in. And I just want to start sort of quite broadly and, and just ask you a bit more about the, the sort of the process uh, about how you um, uh, take sort of data to start with and how that moves through Serence and into the, your, your uh, customers' cars to create that voice experience. Can you just say a bit about that process? Yeah, sure. So over these uh, several decades of development, um, we started by providing core technologies and then there were other technology partners such as the tier ones integrating those into a voice experience. But um, what we have found is um, that we um, could um, better leverage our expertise by delivering an end-to-end -end, um, automotive uh, voice assistant for the car, uh, which we've called Seren's Assistant. And uh, this has been extremely well received. We have a lot of orders for Seren's Assistant uh, that is going to be shipping with a variety um, of um, brands in the very near future. Um, and uh, by levering, leveraging uh, Seren's Assistant, we have then control um, not only over the voice search, but also the dialogue and even the uh, integration, the business logic, as we call it, in the car with the radio um, uh, APIs as provided uh, through the Android layer. That, that's, that's really interesting. Thanks. And we'll come on to that for sure. And um, just, to, just as, again, for context and understanding, uh, you provide a kind of white label voice assistant for the car companies, I think. Uh, now, how does that work in the car alongside some of the other voice assistants like like google assistant or alexa for example yeah great question so um multi-assistant operability is very important for us and allowing our technology to coexist uh, with that uh, of other providers um, we want to allow consumers and users to bring their digital life their preferences into the car and we also have some other products uh, in that same uh, using that same philosophy for example, um, enabling the users to, for example, operate smart home controls um, from, from the car through um, our assistant. Um, another example of uh, this interoperability that we have brought to the market is uh, something we call Enhanced Siri, um, where it is the Seren's wake word uh, detection that will then um, route the call to Siri. And we have also shipped cars, for example, with BMW, where we do the recognition, uh, the wake word recognition for Alexa, and then when the user calls for Alexa, route it there. Um, but of course, uh, we want to provide um, coexistence. At the same time, we see a huge value in a branded assistant. This allows the OEMs to differentiate. This allows the OEMs to have a voice assistant with a deep sensor integration, um, which they no, don't necessarily want to um, open up to the big tech companies. Um, this also uh, enables multi-seat personalization that we can do so we can detect who is talking into the car and um, then um, customize the responses to, to that person. Uh, and ultimately also uh, multimodal functionalities that we support and that we can better deliver in close collaboration with the uh, OEM. So you, I mean, you, you're really at the heart of this ecosystem. So let's talk about radio a bit, because you mentioned earlier, you've got the ability to get effectively to get radio working well in car. Now, how, how do you do that? How do you ensure radio is a good experience in the car? Sure. Uh, so through these decades of experience, we have uh, worked hard on recognizing radio station names, which as many of, of people in the audience will know is, is far from trivial. Um, the, this challenge of recognizing radio station names also changes over time. Uh, more stations may become available through DAB or through internet radio, hybrid radio, um, and also the technology changes. In the past, we had more rule-based systems, and um, then with the advent of more statistical language modeling, also uh, our approach to how we recognize uh, radio station names changes. Um, Collaboration on data is, is really the key here. So talking uh, with you here, um, having the data on um, all the different station names, the variants in which they can be spoken, also understanding the availability of these uh, station names and even the content, which is something we can even talk, we can uh, maybe talk about in a few seconds. And, and so given your 
experience and expertise. You mentioned sort of searching for station, but what are the main use cases that you see see for radio in the car? What are the most important ones that you see? Yeah, so I, I actually went and, and had a look at, at what people say in the car because we have our cloud uh, data where we can uh, look at that. And uh, really the top use case is play and then the name of a station, play BBC One. Uh, that's the, the top use case. Some other use cases that I found um, and not surprising at all would be simply turn on the radio or turn it off. And also a simple command like change the station where, where apparently the user doesn't care which one as long as it's a different one. And so I mean, for, for us, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, we see there's plenty of scope to improve the voice experience and the accuracy of search, for example, going to the right local stage is something that we at Radio Player have worked really hard on. But, but how do you see, think that, that radio and voice could be improved in the future? Yeah, sure. So um, I think continuing to work on search accuracy, recognizing what the user is asking for is really number one. Um, and also to be pointed out, uh, I think there was there have always been language challenges there, uh, cross country challenges. You're in Germany, but you want to ask for an English station and so on. Um, I think that will uh, increase um, as the availability of, of uh, radio stations also from other countries will increase with with the connected car. Um, I also believe and, and maybe it's something we can uh, speak in some more depth about is um, looking for content uh, more and more relevant potentially in the future um, and that would of course then leverage uh, the fact that content is available in a more reliable and, and stable way um, through um, internet radio and hybrid radio. Well, well maybe we can just touch on that to finish now because um, you know, it'd be quite given the, your position in the market it'd be good to get your take on what the future holds and what it might hold for radio um, I know you've got some exciting products out there like the co-pilot, but can you say a bit more about that and how you see the future for voice developing in the car? So very generally speaking, um, and, and I also brought another slide, we can maybe switch to it. Um, we are working on a number of innovations in the car, uh, voice in the car, uh, and some of these innovations we've bundled under uh, the Serens co-pilot. Um, so Obviously, voice is the most interactive, um, the most natural way to interact with a system that would include um, searching for media contents. Um, it's also the safest way. Um, we have a super exciting uh, product out recently that people might appreciate, which we call emergency vehicle detection, where we use the microphones in the car to actually detect if there is an emergency vehicle outside the car. And we can even predict the direction that it's coming from and so increase the safety, safety and help drivers to be aware of it. Um, another very important characteristic of this co-pilot is that it's proactive. So it can tell you um, about uh, interesting, um, perhaps interesting media contents that, that you would like to listen to um, or, or uh, shows near you or uh, when you have an appointment coming up, when you need, when your vehicle is due for service or your gas is running low or your battery is running low. So there is a lot of, um, relevant and and um, safety relevant uh, utility relevant information that can be shared so you think that that proactive uh, uh push if you like towards other content could be relevant for radio as well yeah absolutely so um sharing um, um interesting content that we know that the listener is interested in or um just uh, remembering some of their preferences related to media um, also, the, the aspect of personalization. So who is asking, uh, who is now currently driving the car and is asking for content? So if somebody from the back seat asks uh, to turn on the radio, maybe they want to listen to something else than the person in the front seat. Fantastic. Um, Johan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I know we, we will continue this conversation. Um, we're delighted to have you and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much there uh, to Lawrence and Johan, who is also sitting right here. Very confusing. You are seeing double. <gasps> it is not an illusion. Um, but a really insight there on how voice assistance will impact that in-car experience. Exciting stuff to look forward to. And um, also, of course, big thank you to all of the speakers in that session. Now, we are running out of time. I know everyone is hungry for lunch. So we are going to very quickly crack on with the Q&A session. Um, Gregor, I think we're going to kick it off with you. <laughs> um, Thanks. One of the questions says, um, as a radio station, it's not easy to provide the data directly to VW. 
and it doesn't happen very swiftly. Is there any talk about standardised metadata between VW and other German or international car manufacturers? Uh, of course there is, because this is why we are at World Up and talking with the, with the industry, not only with the car manufacturers, but also the broadcasters. This is why we are here today and all the years before, because we are investing um, time and effort to work with the Etsy specification for standarding, standardizing um, all the metadata. So there's one standard to deliver all the metadata into our car. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, question to you, Jason. Um, what metadata should broadcasters be providing for the car? Interesting one. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good one. All of it, I think, is the, uh, the first answer. Is the, the, um, <laughs> first answer but, uh, How much is too much? <laughs> Which is uh, too much. In, in all seriousness, I think <laughs> there's there's two parts to it. There's um, there's serious. the static data, which, which is, actually is actually station name, station, name, station logo, station logo, how the station logo, might be referred how to, the station the voice, might be referred which to generally useful voice, voice, future, which generally useful um, future, and, um, and audio streams, uh, audio things streams, that don't change very kind of much. Things that don't and change. And then there's dynamic much. data, which would typically there's dynamic be data uh, for a music station, the track, for a music station, the track. Um, so playing, it would be title artist, um, so and, it would be title uh, a high resolution, and, uh, a high resolution of the artist or some album art. Of the artist or some um, and for a station that um, has less music, for a station that has or less music, talk, it might be the uh, show. Perhaps so talk, details might of the show center, uh, details and images to go center. along with it. And, and, and stations could choose to do both. But at least that means when the user's looking at the radio station, there's either a show image or, or a track image that they can see. But those are the key ones, really. Jason, and uh, apologies, it dropped out slightly there, but um, we got uh, the core message there, the core answer. Um, and uh, Lawrence, a final question for you. What are the immediate next steps to improve radio and to improve voice? Well, I think we touched on it in the interview there. The, the first priority has to be to be able to ensure that when somebody's asking for a station in the car using voice, they get given the right station. Yeah. We've seen way too many examples uh, in cars <laughs> on the road today where somebody asks for a station and they either get the wrong station or if, for example, it's a station that is a national brand but delivered locally, they get the, lo the wrong local variant. So that relies on, unsurprisingly, good metadata. So that's provision of synonyms, so there's different ways of asking for a station, phonemes and phonetics, so that that can be recognised and, and, and said back correctly by, by, the, by the assistant. And then it's about collaboration with companies like Serence and the other voice assistants, directly with um, the broadcasters and the car manufacturers. So that has to be the first priority. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant stuff there. Well, sorry, that was a, a quick Q&A, but I know you're a hungry bunch. Um, so a huge thank you once again to all of our speakers. That's taken us um, into a slightly shorter lunch break, though, because we're going to be back here kicking off in 45 minutes. Hopefully that's long enough for you. Um, and also for everyone that is here with us in the room, do remember um, to go and visit our exhibitors booth that is here at the venue in King's Cross in London um, and for everyone else that is watching at home there is a virtual exhibitor uh, there's a booth that you can go and watch on that virtual platform so go and enjoy that one and we will see you back here in less than 45 minutes for some more great speakers and content see you then